It's possible that this morning I may preach the most boring sermon that you have ever heard. If you have been reading through Matthew, I imagine some themes have emerged. And this morning, we're going to talk about one of those many themes. We're going to talk about Jesus and Jesus' conflict with the church, with religious leaders, with the powers that be. And this theme begins around chapter 9, and and it continues through the end of uh, the gospel. It pretty much permeates the last half of Matthew's gospel. Now, if you, like me, grew up in a bubble of personal faith, you might not have thought about the theme of Jesus resisting and uh, coming into conflict with systematic injustice and evil. But I want us to look at that this morning. (laughs) During Holy Week, I grew up and we focused on individuals, not systems. We talked about Peter and his betrayal. We talked about Judas and his kiss. We talked about Pilate and his hand washing. But if we look in the scriptures, if we read through the scriptures, we'll see that Jesus was convicted of blasphemy, which is a thought or theological crime. He was convicted in an after-hours court filled with prosecutorial misconduct and false testimony. And after he's convicted in the church trial, the leaders will huddle up and they'll strategize and they'll change the charge from blasphemy to treason when they bring him into the state courts in front of Pontius Pilate. And Matthew will offer some good news in the middle of the Holy Week that it's just interesting. It's only Matthew. He says that Judas repents. And what does Judas do? He goes to the church, the place of atonement, the place of sacrifice, where people go to get right with God. And he brings back these coins, and sanctimoniously the church folks say, no, 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 we can't take your blood money. You know, if we walk through Lent only focused on our personal faith, we may miss the depths of God's love, the deepness of God's call to love our neighbor as ourselves. We may not even quite understand what Jesus is talking about when he talks about an alternative kingdom, the kingdom of God. And we may not understand how crucial our baptismal vows to resist evil, injustice, and oppression really are to anyone's identity as a Christian. Well, it kind of starts to bubble up around chapter 9. The people bring Jesus, a person who was paralyzed, and it says that Jesus, seeing their faith, said, be encouraged, my child. Isn't that beautiful? Your sins are forgiven. Jesus removes the stigma stigma that was often associated with physical differences. And the legal experts pouted. This man is insulting God. How? By freely forgiving sins, by taking that authority. You know, we're still living that today, aren't we, in the church? People that that want to limit forgiveness, that want to cut people out and exclude people. And you know, twice, Jesus says in Matthew 16, and then again 18, just in case we missed it, I assure you, Jesus said, whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. (laughs) Chapter 9 ends with the Bible experts accusing Jesus of being in league with the devil, with a king of demons. That'll be a theme too. In Matthew 10, Jesus commissions the disciples to go out and heal people and to proclaim this message. God's kingdom has come near. And you know this idea that God is with us is a powerful and disruptive message. It is a little radical, actually. It says God is with us as we feed people, as we clothe people, as we welcome people, as we proclaim forgiveness to people. God is with us. 
even when we flip over tables or stand with prisoners. God's kingdom is about more than prayer services and private devotion. It's about including people, defending people, and resisting evil. And so as the chapter closes, Jesus warns, watch out for people. (laughs) They will hand you over to church councils, they'll beat you up, and they'll haul you off to the governors. Dear ones, if they called me Beelzebub, it is certain that they will call you even worse names. In chapter 11, Jesus critiques the critics. He says, John the Baptist came and did not eat or drink. And you said, John has a demon. And the son of humans comes (laughs) eating and drinking. And you say, oh, he's a lousy friend of sinners and drunkards. Jesus is kind of saying, why is it that some people can never be for anyone or anything. And then again, for the third chapter in a row, Jesus' enemies link Jesus' authority and personhood with the devil. Three chapters in a row. You know, friends, um, today people are attacking our trans and queer siblings. And if you're feeling the weight of that attack, just, just have a little encouragement. They, they said the same kind of things about Jesus. In chapter 12, the religious leaders are upset that Jesus breaks the laws on the Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath laws were punishable by death in Exodus 35. And as early as chapter 13, they begin to plot to destroy Jesus. And Jesus tells a story, a parable about a farmer who planted wheat in their fields, and during the night an enemy slips in and sows tares or weeds among the wheat. You know, that parable always puzzled me. But you know, maybe if you're in a struggle with systems or with people that are pushing you down and beating you up and feel like enemies, maybe maybe Jesus is saying there are enemies, you know? There are sneaky and mean people who want to do harm. We need to remember that Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us as we forgive others. But in that same prayer, Jesus prays, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from evil. In Matthew 14, King Herod murders John the Baptist while John is in custody. And John's disciples, they tenderly come to Jesus and find comfort. And then they all break away to be alone by themselves because We need time. And friends, if you're feeling pushed down by whatever it is, if you're feeling pushed down, if you're feeling crushed, if you're feeling encircled by lines or just by the homework that you're never going to get done, be of good cheer. Our Lord knows the pain of this life in all its forms. In chapter 15, Jesus undoes the... works with the Levitical law, proclaiming, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that contaminates a person. It's what comes out of the mouth. Evil, murder, broken vows, promiscuity, theft, lying, insults. That contaminates a person. And then the disciples say to Jesus, they say, don't you know that the Pharisees, and he could have just as well said the good Methodists, don't you know that the good Methodists were offended by what you said? And if you read a little further, you'll see that Jesus doesn't seem that concerned about offending people who want to exclude others. And friends, there are forces in the church that want us to moderate and to step back from our inclusion so that people who want to exclude can speak more freely. I don't see that in Jesus, but I invite you to read chapter 15 for yourself. In chapter 16, Jesus uh, asks, who do you say I am? And Peter makes that beautiful confession. And then immediately there's a pivot. Jesus begins to show them from that time on that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, the legal experts, and that he had to be killed and on the third day raised again. 
In chapter 17, Jesus will repeat that again after being on the Mount of Transfiguration. The human one's about to be delivered over into human hands and they will kill him. But on the third day, he will be raised. And they were all heartbroken. You could preach a whole sermon about that, couldn't you? And they were all heartbroken. Sometimes we feel like it's not a Christian thing to be heartbroken, but it says they were all, they were all heartbroken. In chapter 19, there's more testing. In chapter 20, while making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, it says for the third time, Jesus tells his disciples, look, we are going up to Jerusalem and the human one will be handed over to the chief priest and the legal experts and they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles to be ridiculed, tortured, and crucified. But on the third day, he will raise from the dead. I wanted to make a poster, but I forgot. Three times. Three times. This message is repeated three times. It matters. And so I want to ask you directly this morning, how does the fact that Jesus will be betrayed and mistreated by systems of organized evil, injustice, and oppression, how does that shape your personal faith? How does that guide you? How does that help you look out into the world? What does that mean when you see those that are oppressed, pushed down, and wounded? Who do you stand with because of who Jesus is? Do you understand your baptismal vow? to resist evil, injustice, and and oppression as fundamental to your identity in Christ. In chapter 21, right after Palm Sunday, Jesus goes into the temple and throws out all who were buying and selling there. And, And in Mark's account, it says he shut it down. He shut it down. Shut down the heart of their worship. And the people were chanting, it is written, and Jesus was repeating, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made the church a hideout for crooks. And the powers that be demanded, by what authority are you doing these things? They're always concerned about that authority thing. And they tried to arrest Jesus, but they feared the crowds who believed that he was a prophet. In chapter 22, an alliance of the Pharisees, they were Torah students, they were observant, they were devout, they were, they were working hard to try to make their neighborhoods and their synagogues the best they could. And the Hellenized supporters of King Herod, these groups don't get along, they don't see, they don't see the world in the same kind of way, they have very different ideas. And in chapter 16, it talks about the Sadducees. That's a third group, more secularized and scholarly. These three groups that have absolutely, almost have nothing in common, they all come together. They all come together in order to entrap and stop Jesus' work. In chapter 23, Jesus rails You know, chapter 23 is so hot, the lectionary committee just mostly left it alone. You shut people out of the kingdom of heaven. Could there be a harder thing to say to a bunch of preachers? Well, Jesus will say, you find a convert, convert and make them twice a child of hell as you are. That might even be harder. You shut people out of the kingdom of heaven, but you don't enter yourself. And you won't let those who want to enter do so. And you won't let those who want to belong, belong. You tie up heavy burdens. And you don't lift a finger to help. Oh, I'm sending you prophets and wise people and legal experts, and some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them, you'll just run out of town. And Jesus ends this rebuke in tears, weeping over the very systems that will kill him. 
In chapter 24, Jesus warns us that faithful Christians will be arrested, abused, and killed and tells us it's okay to flee that persecution when it happens. In chapter 26, Jesus will be tried twice, first by the church and then by the state. And the police will lay hands on Jesus and they will slap him and beat him and mock him. And the whole system will keep him awake all night long. And Matthew notes that the whole council was looking for false testimony against Jesus and they will sentence him to blasphemy in this church trial. And then we go over to chapter 27 and it says, At first light, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to bring about his death. You see, they know as they move from the religious courts to Pilate's secular court that Pilate doesn't give a whit about that charge of blasphemy. So they bring up treason instead. They're not even true to their charge. But you know, friends, let's, let's, not, uh, let's not blame the crowd. Let's look deeper into the systems. And let's be careful not to blame the Jewish people. Everybody in the story is a Jewish person. It could as well be us. And what do we do with all this conflict? What do we do with this stress? What do we do with Jesus' struggle? I think we need to wrestle with it. I think we need to let it get into our systems, our beliefs. It needs to shape who we are and how we understand loving our neighbor as ourselves. It needs to soak in so that when we see judicial misconduct or church trials or oppression, that perhaps we see Jesus. And if we are feeling encircled or pushed down or broken, maybe we need to remember that Jesus knows that deeply and fully. You know, on Easter, the angels proclaim, Christ is risen. And going ahead of you. That is such good news, isn't it? God's out in front of us, pulling us along, pulling a reluctant church, pulling a reluctant pastor, pulling us closer and deeper into love. And then Matthew says that the the risen Christ came near. I love that. The risen Christ came near and said, I've received all authority in heaven and earth, therefore go and make disciples of all people, baptizing and teaching them everything I've commanded you. And look, I myself will be with you every day now until the end of the age. Oh, friends, hear the good news. If we feel encircled, if we feel crushed, if we are filled with the joy of Easter, Christ is with us, and Christ knows our pain. Christ is crucified, dead, buried, and risen, and going ahead of us, and leading us into the deeper love of God that loves all people and longs to bring about a kingdom where we no longer need to resist evil and justice or oppression, because we know equality, equity, and love. May we work for those things in this world. Amen.